The Scream Kings are in no way responsible for any encounters with the paranormal, extraterrestrial abductions, eldritch insanity, hauntings, curses, hexes, demonic possessions, cryptozoological sightings, or any loss of sleep that results from listening to this podcast. This is the Scream Kings Podcast. I'm Nathaniel Darkish. And today I have two very special guests with me. I have Willow Don Becker and Mike Clough. Welcome both of you to the show. And uh, I'm going to have you uh, introduce yourselves. Uh, who, who wants to go first? Ladies first. Oh, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm excited to be here. My name is Willow Don Becker, and uh, I am a horror writer, science fiction writer and uh, co-founder of Weird Little Worlds Press, which is a press for science fiction, fantasy, horror, and adventure, both nonfiction and fiction. I am super excited to be here. I love Nathaniel. He's great. I've known him for a bit. Yeah, yeah. We uh, became friends at a, a horror writer, well, at a writing conference for a, at a horror writers meetup and instantly hit it off and have, or I guess, yeah, we, we've met and exchanged writing and stuff like that since then. And uh, so, yeah, Willow reached out to me about this uh, a project that she's working on, this, you know, the Weird Little Worlds Press. Uh, and so, yeah, we also have Mike Clough here, who is involved in this project as well. So uh, go ahead and introduce yourself, Mike. Yeah, so I'm Mike Clough. Um, I also am a writer, not necessarily horror. I've done a little bit, but not nearly as much as, as Willow, um, per se, but also an editor. And that's how I got into the small press game was editing short stories and and uh, an online magazine that turned into a press and then imploded and died. And then Willow came along and said, hey, let me help you start something else new. And I was like, cool. So that's where we're at. So, yeah, one thing we like to do, uh, obviously, we're going to talk about the press in a, in a minute here. Yeah, horror related uh, stuff is uh going to be coming out of that so we definitely want to hear all about that and you know have you guys have a chance to shamelessly plug your stuff but yeah but before we do i do want to kind of just you know, kind of get a little bit more of your like horror origin stories you know what what drew you first to horror you know have you always been a fan of horror things like that uh let's go mike first this time and then we'll switch over to willow so i am the youngest of six um i have four older sisters and they learned on my brother who's you know since i'm the youngest he's older than me they learned from him that uh uh psychological trauma doesn't show like physical trauma does so they learned that they could really uh control us and and <laughs> make our lives living hell at times by messing with us and scaring us to death yeah that's where a lot of probably my fascination with horror comes from is the fact that i had to deal with it all the time with my sisters <laughs> torturing me as a little kid well as the oldest of six children in my family, yeah, that that's definitely true. That 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 is a go-to method for torturing your younger siblings. So, I mean, just as a side note, I I had a recurring dream up until I was like, I had it from the time I was like four up until I was like twenty-five of sleeping on the end of a bed because um, I'd have to do that quite a bit because we just had to share beds and I didn't want to sleep next to people. I'd rather sleep at the foot of the bed. And I have this dream of this white hand reaching up and patting around on the bed in front of me. And I push it away and then it lurches out again and grabs me by the neck and I, everything blacks out. And it's... Oh my gosh, it's terrifying. Yeah. And so I, this dream, I'd have it all the time. It was constant. Like It was at least three or four times a year until, like I said, until I was like 25. And we're... And I'm, I'm I'm good relationship with all my siblings now, and we're adults now, and we we're not quite as mean to each other. And we were sitting around talking about reoccurring dreams, and I bring this up. And my second oldest sister, we're at her house, and she looks at me, and she just has this sheepish, like sort of shamed look on her face. And I look at her, I'm like, "What did you do?" And she's like, "Well, the first time it happened probably wasn't a dream." I'm like, "What did you do?" And she's like, "Well." I dipped my hand in water and then in flour and waited until you were in bed and the lights were off and then did that to you. I'm like, you realize, <laughs> you realize <laughs> years of trauma, years of trauma. That's amazing. And I'm like, you realize that 
you scared me so bad as a four-year-old that I passed out from fear. Like, literally, you made me black out from fear. And she's like, yeah, it was pretty awesome when I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness, that's terrible. So, so there we oh. go. Um, but yeah, other origin. You know, I we kind of VCR when I was little, and we, you know, pretty much anything that wasn't necessarily rated R, we could get our hands on. We'd watch, and we'll probably, you know, my parents probably could have been a little bit better about filtering some of that because back in the eighties, PG meant something that it, different than it does now. But we'd. Uh, We'd end up with movies like Snow Beast, which came out in 1977, and I, I mean, we started watching it probably in like 85, you know, and there's this killer, killer Sasquatch Yeti thing up at the ski resort, and anytime it would go to kill somebody, you'd never see it, but the screen would go red, and then it would show the Snow Beast going, you know, and I remember watching that, and there's a scene where they're all in this, in this high school gym, and there's supposed to be this beauty pageant going on and the snow beast gets below the gym and he's like popping his hand through the, the floorboards and like grabbing people and like getting on and there's an old lady that's like oh it's horrible the queen the crowd you know and stuff like that and it's just I laugh at that stuff and I probably shouldn't have as a you know a five year old I thought it was hilarious so you know that probably was part of the reason why I was trying to deal with the trauma for my family but <laughs> <laughs> things like that i we would watch those shows i remember watching the changeling which was another movie that came out a long time ago and the uh, you know the scene where it's in a haunted house and it's like seattle or something like that and there's a ghost and the guy's just sitting there trying to write a book and this ball comes bouncing down the stairs and he hears this laughing and he's like oh, whatever and so he throws the ball away from him and then it comes bouncing down the stairs again and then he like runs outside and throws it in the river and then the ball comes bouncing down the stairs again and it's all wet and i'm just like ah i mean that was that was probably one of my first experiences with a true horror story that are not true horror but a, a horror movie that i was like really just a little bit creeped out by so or or, or i'm sure the uh wheelchair scene probably wasn't much better let's let's be real yeah yeah the wheelchair scene and when he breaks open that closet at the top of the stairs and he goes into the other room. And I've had a fascination ever since I watched that. I've had a fascination with, uh, finding a secret room in a house and all, and things like that, which is sort of creepy because we did find a secret room in my parents' house that had a small rocking chair and a single shoe in it. And that house was haunted too. So it was a little creepy. It's pretty weird, actually. Yeah, that, that's like weirdly <laughs> specific stuff. Yeah. Well, and the, the, the hole that you could get into that secret compartment was not big enough to bring the chair out through. So the chair was the, the, the because it's a half, half sort of, like there's a full basement in my parents' house. And then um, sometime in the 50s, they added on a, a bedroom and they didn't dig a full foundation. Um, a full basement extension they just dug probably about four or five feet down so when we were remodeling a little bit of the basement we found the hole in the wall and we looked in there and it's you know it's through the, the cement foundation so we we went in there and we're looking around and tried to get the chair out and it wouldn't fit through the hole so the, all that built around the chair so that's really creepy too yeah that's a little upsetting <laughs> So, yeah, and then probably from that, I've always had a, an appreciation for Edgar Allan Poe. I mean, maybe that's, you know, sort of commonplace with the, in the in the horror community. I don't know, but I've always loved Poe. I've always loved The Descent and the Madness, and then I found Lovecraft later, and the whole concept of starting to go insane and doubt your own reality and things of that sort, that type of stuff really gets to me. So I think that's where a lot of my horror my affinity for horror comes from. Willow, how about you? What What is your horror origin story? Oh, man. That's a good question. Um, I feel like if if horror... I think... I feel like every horror author or people who write horror can trace their love back to a trauma. Like, I don't know if that's... I don't, I don't know if that's 100% true. But I feel like that's, prob- that's probably true much of the time 
And I was um, really little and I, I had several incredibly traumatic events happen around horror mo- movies, actually. <clears throat> I actually was forced to watch really scary movies when I was really little. Like I was three when I saw Poltergeist and I was four when I saw Evil Dead. And in both of those cases, I had people who forced me to watch those movies and uh, they're just terrifying. Like I, I like my I remember I, I recently <clears throat> mentioned this to my mom. <laughs> it's like I saw, you know, there's this boy and he was really big. He was like 15 and he forced me to he held me down and made me watch this movie, like made me watch Poltergeist. And I was crying and I was like, I don't want to watch this. I don't want to watch this. And then I went home and and my mom's like. Oh, yeah, I remember you talked about that jello in the bathtub for a really long time. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it traumatized me. I was so terrified of it. So uh, that's when it really started is as I had these really traumatic experiences where I and I like saw Evil Dead the same way where I like I was like, I don't want to watch this. My babysitter's like, you're going to watch this movie. We're watching this movie. So anyway, I had a bunch of really bad babysitters and uh, watching this NC-17 movie. <laughs> Exactly. Like, I don't know why I watched this tree rape as a four year old, but that's what I did. And then I had a problem for the rest of my life. So so I've been kind of trying to deal with that, I think, for the rest of my life is just trying to manage the kind of fascination with horror. That's also kind of dealing with my, you know, like it it is fascinating. It's very interesting. And it has like it totally has changed my life. Uh, I think I was 11. When I stole my dad's copy of Pet Cemetery, he had had it laying around and my mom was, you know, I come from a really religious background and my mom, like we wouldn't, we couldn't even really talk about stuff like ghosts and stuff. She would, she'd get really uncomfortable. She still does. And the truth is I do too. Like I, I won't talk about a lot of that stuff, but that's so why I had to steal this book. And then I watched and I, I kept it like boys keep porno mags under under their mattress like that's why i had this pet cemetery under my mattress and when everybody was asleep i'd pull it out and i would read it uh and it was just amazing you know like it's it's still i believe the most terrifying book i've ever read it is just incredible so i don't know that's kind of how i got into it i just always was kind of compelled towards the most dark things and i was just saying this on another podcast we were just talking about i had this I was really young. I I was like only four or five. Serious. I was so little. And we had this trailer and there would be this howling like at night when the wind would hit the the trailer screens. It would go, you know, and it was so scary. I was terrified. And I was I was positive that there was ghosts and they would come every night and, and they were haunting me. And so eventually I was so terrified and I couldn't move. I was just like paralyzed. Eventually, I I was just like, you know what? If I join them, they will not kill me. <laughs> and so I was like, hello, ghosts. I'm on your side. I love ghosts. I want to be a ghost. So I like, I had this entire thing I would do every night where I was like, hey, ghosts, you know me. I love ghosts. I want to be one of you. And that was kind of, I don't know, I think that's when I sold my soul. I was really little. Well, I, I don't know if saying I love ghosts, I want to be a ghost is a good way to not become a ghost because right. that seems to be inviting them <laughs> murdering you. But I mean, that's just exactly. I don't know. It was my idea was if I if I'm very if I'm pro ghost, if I have a pro ghost agenda, then they will not want to kill me. And they didn't. So I assumed that it worked. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's that's infallible logic to me. I think so. Okay. Well, one thing that we also like to ask all of our guests is basically, you know, what is a horror movie or book or short story? And it could be uh, a few of these. And and we're going to talk short stories more later. So maybe, you know, movie or book that is, uh, you know, just like your all time favorite. What what is the top tier horror to you? Um, I'll I'll go ahead. Um, I'm not. I'm not as, uh, I guess you could say, involved in the horror community or familiar with it as much. I, I just try to find stories wherever I can go. And uh, I would say probably one of my favorite horror stories that I could get into, and it's actually a series. It's a series of books, and they're technically young adult books, and that's how I found them, is The Monstermologist by Rick Yancey. Um, have any of you guys read that? 
I've seen it around, but I have never actually picked it up. Okay. I have not. He does some really crazy things. He he his his storytelling ability is just phenomenal and his imagery is next level. And the first one deals with I can't even remember what the the Greek name for these monsters are, but he, he pulls all the monsters for the series out of out of mythology, out of um different cultures. Because I think it's the second or the third one he has the Wendigo, and that one is just terrifying. But the the first one, it's the monsters and the Greek monsters, and they don't, they're basically like huge men or women, and they don't have heads. The Their faces and their mouths are actually on in their chest area, and they're cannibals. They are not cannibals, but they like to eat men. So it's it's creepy. And it's based in the in the 1800s, and basically the monstermologist is a guy that has to has to go and he understands or not understands, but he knows about monsters and he's having to go down and uh, and and take them out. But the story is all from the point of view of his apprentice, and so it's it's uh, if you if you haven't read it, you have to read it because it's just it's phenomenal. And the by the time you're done with the series, you're just you're your mind's blown because there's once again that descent, the madness type stuff that goes on, and the uh, unreliable narrators, and there's even Jack the Ripper in there at times, and it's it's super fun, but it gave me nightmares. Like I think honestly, that's probably the only book I've read that's given me nightmares. Well, so I guess that might actually answer the the follow up question I had for you, Mike, which is what is the scariest movie or book that you've seen? Is is it that one or i would probably say that that's the scariest book i've read um and really enjoyed there's some other books i you know i picked up and i've read that are scary but i didn't really i didn't enjoy reading them it was more like maybe shock factor or something like that so it wasn't really something that i would recommend out to another people i you know that i like a quality story i like depth and i like ones that really suck me in so yeah this one did that now as far as movies Probably one of the scariest movies that I like to go back to, and it's probably not scary to a lot of people, and it's partially because I really liked Val Kilmer back when Val Kilmer looked like Val Kilmer, and that is The Ghost in the Darkness. And it's not a horror movie, but it's based off of true events. Uh, have any of you, have either of you seen that? I, I don't think I've even heard of this one, but I'm going to check it out now. I've heard I've heard of Ghost in the Darkness, but I've never. So seen it. it's based off of uh, true events that happened. Um, I believe it was either the late 1800s or early 1900s, and uh, it's the the account of a British bridge builder who goes down to Africa in a place called Sabo. But the problem is that, that pops up is that there's two lions that are there that are just constantly massacring people and it gets to the point where oh i remember everybody yeah i i do remember hearing about this yeah and it gets to the point where people just won't work and they're gone and there's all kinds of things that happen like at one point in time they they move the hospital because they're advised that hey this hospital is going to be a place that is going to get attacked and there's so many people that are in the hospital because they're acting like they're sick so they don't have to work and the and they set up a the a trap for the lions in the old hospital with like you know a ton of blood cows and just basically it's like a smorgasbord that they offer for it and the lions don't even care they just ignore the cows and everything and they go find the new hospital and slaughter everybody and this is all that's incredible it's, yeah that's amazing it's all documented there's actually a documentary that you can watch it's called the slaughter of Savo. They're not sure. A lot of people now are like, you know, there's probably only, there's probably only like ten to fifteen people, but according that were killed. But according to the documentary, it could have been up in the hundreds. And there's even they even talk about in the um, the account that they went to go track down the lions, and they find a cave where there's just bones and bones and bones and dead, and just. And it's to the point where the the lions were just killing people for the sake of killing them. And it's just creepy, it's just the details and everything. The part that really creeped me out is that the that like the, the witch doctors in there said that they were 
they were possessed lions and that's why they were doing that. And it was just, it's just creepy. And the fact that it really happened makes it so I just never want to go to Africa anyway, you know, because the lions freak me out now. And those lions are actually in one of the field museums here in the United States and you can go and see them. They are taxidermied and they're, because when they finally were able to kill them, they, they stuffed them and brought them back to the United States. Well, that sounds awesome and creepy and fascinating. I'm uh, definitely going to watch this movie now. Yeah, that's so cool. I, I remember hearing about that and um, what a compelling story. Like, this is exactly the kind of thing that, you know, this is the reason why Mike and I are working together because this is the kind of like high adventure, high suspense, uh, horror kind of stuff I really love. I think that it doesn't have to be monsters that are, are uh, imaginary or, you know, like legendary. I think I think real life monsters are totally worth are totally worth watching as well. That's pretty cool. Yes, yeah. What 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 is your favorite uh piece of horror? Well, horror literature. That's such a hard question. I don't know. What's yours, Nathaniel? <laughs> like I feel like that's a really difficult question and I was even prepared, right? Well, I mean, if you want mine, I'll tell you. Yeah, I want yours. Well, tell me. That Best movie is Alien, and nice. best uh, best horror novel is Duma Key by Stephen King. Oh, that's really interesting. That's a really interesting choice. That's cool. That's actually a, that's a Stephen King book I've not read. Well, you should fix that because it's his best book. I should. That's really interesting. I uh, I would disagree, but I've never read it. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's cool. Alien is a really good one. In fact, um, I write science fiction horror, so. Aliens actually one of my very top favorite movies um, of all time, but I don't think it's the scariest. My favorite horror movie is really dumb, and like I'm kind of embarrassed to say it because because <laughs> there are a lot of people who really don't like it. But um, my f- I'm trying to like think of a, a like a cool response, but the answer is I'm just not cooler than I am. My favorite horror movie is The Descent. Oh, uh, The Descent is amazing. So. Uh, yeah, it's it is incredible. I like I absolutely adore it. I actually watch it probably once a month. I'll, I just I sit down and I watch it like some women watch. I don't know Downton Abbey, whatever girls watch that I don't watch. Like there's a I don't know what people do that are normal, but that's what I do. As I'll like you know like I I like I need some like me time, and I'll sit down and watch The Descent because <laughs> like it's just such a great movie and the truth is is i long for i yearn for women-centric horror like i just want it so bad and uh like uh, i have mentioned a million times i am a huge gamma files fan which is why it's so cool if she's working with us for our anthology but i am such a huge gamma files fan she is so well versed when it comes to horror and sometimes she'll like put these things out she'll be like oh there's this really great you know let's scare jennifer to death and or like she'll throw out these all female or really female centric horror movies and i'm like oh my gosh i have to go learn everything about that movie and go watch it so anyway that that's my favorite uh horror movie is uh the descent and i literally watch it once a month for sure well, yeah, it's a great choice. I, I really love the descent. Yeah, I do too. There's just a lot of people who are like, the, the, the monsters are so stupid. I don't know. There's like people who are like, those monsters just aren't very, I like it up until the monsters show up. And I'm like, you guys suck. Those monsters are great. <laughs> Anyone who says that can fight me. I, I don't, I'm not interested yeah, in being their friend. Seriously. Yeah, really. Like, I just, I honestly love, I think that it, it like hits all of my buttons, right? Because I love, Adventure is my net, like buzzword. Like that is what my life is all about. And so I love the idea of these, you know, it's kind of fun. It's funny. The writing is really, really good. Um, and there's all of this tension and suspense that just comes from these women trying to cr- like just trying to survive this cave, which is awesome. So it's kind of a survival story. But then it turns into like a legitimate monster movie halfway through which is awesome and it just hits all my three act structure buttons you know like i just love it and i love there's also this kind of internal transition that kind of goes along with the external transition and then there's the whole layer of what does the movie mean 
because there are elements of that movie, and I'm not going to spoil that movie for anybody who hasn't seen it, but there are elements of that movie that if you're paying attention to will make you pause and say, wait, what is going on here? What, what, ha- what is happening right now in reality? Because the reality of the situation might be slightly different than what we perceive it to be. You know what I'm saying? There's actually, there's some layers on that that I really like. I have not seen the second one and I don't think I'm ever yeah, going to. Yeah, no, uh, save yourself so. that because it's hot garbage. <laughs> okay, great. That's what I heard. So I decided not to. Yeah, no, I was like, well, yeah, I mean, it might be okay. No, it's not. It, it was, it was bad. Well, which, which ending do you prefer? I'm curious for, for the original. Um... Which ending do I prefer? Um, I guess I have to prefer the one that I've seen. <laughs> and, and I don't know. How, how much can I say? I don't want to ruin it for somebody. Okay, uh, let's just put a spoiler alert here uh, for this. Uh, if, if you haven't seen it, like skip ahead like 30 seconds. Okay, now, now uh, right. go ahead. I just love, I actually love the original. I mean, I, I like the original that I saw, which is when, you know, she gets out um, and, uh, and the, the her her friend who's betrayed her is there in the vehicle. So that's the only one I've oh, seen. Oh, that, that's the that's the lame American ending. There's a better ending. Oh, is it? Oh my gosh. What is what is it? That <laughs> should I go and I should go and watch it. You know what? Let me go yeah, watch it. Yeah, and then and then you know let me know what you think afterward. Yeah, I should because the other I ending is watch way it. more bleak. Oh, is it? Wait, well, I feel like I feel like I actually went down a rabbit hole on this one night, like at like two in the morning. And I don't know. I may have actually seen it, but I don't remember it because the one that I watch over and over again is the one that's just available for me here to watch on Netflix or whatever. So I just don't remember it. Okay. I have to go. I have to go and, and rewatch it. Uh, I'll have to watch the British version. Yes. But yeah. I yeah. Know yeah. It's uh, the, the alternate ending is just yeah, way, way darker. Oh, well, I, I love dark, so I'm not afraid of that. Awesome. I just, yeah, anyway, I'll stop talking about it, but that is my favorite. Uh, horror I'm going to have to check it out. Am I for it? I've never seen it. Yeah, it's, oh, oh my gosh, it's so good. Oh, that's such a good movie. Oh, I love it. And what I love about it, like, and this is going to come up over and over again, Nathaniel, like, so really, is that I don't have to worry. Like, yeah, there's some language and I don't mind that because they're, you know, about to die. But, like, I don't have to worry about seeing someone's boobs in this movie, which is a big plus for me uh, as a female horror watcher. I don't really get off on seeing naked people having sex. So that's one of my favorite parts about that movie. That's good. (laughs) That means I'll probably get to see it as well, because I'm just not a big fan of graphic nudity or anything like that either. So, yay. Yeah, yeah, no, that this is, you know, it's it's a violent movie for sure, and it's dark. But oh, really violent? Yeah, it's it's great. Oh my gosh, I honestly just think every kill in that movie is just phenomenal. I just they're all so great. Oh, and the end is so good. Oh my gosh. Anyway, I just love it. I could talk about it for a really long time. <laughs> I'm not going to. But anyway, yeah, that's my favorite movie. Okay. I love it. Um, what did you also want to talk about? Like a favorite horror novel or anything like that as well? Well, I kind of mentioned that that the scariest novel, but I I think the scariest novel from Stephen King is Pet Cemetery, and it is one of my favorite. The one though that I have been talking about a lot, uh, and Mike has heard me say this already, is um is House of Leaves. Oh, House of Leaves um, by Daniel Lewski. Mm-hmm. And I know that uh, you've probably heard me talk about this before too. I think that it's just so brilliant, and I felt like it did more to unsettle my sense of reality than any other book I've ever read. And that, and that is really just, I mean, that really is just phenomenal storytelling when you, and it's more than just storytelling. Obviously he is doing art with that book. That is a, that's something he's doing. That's really special. And uh, I have not been able to read any of his following books, but I just, I mean, it was so novel. It was so interesting. And it just broke down your brain. It, I mean, it literally just was designed to break your brain down, to, to wear it down to the point where you were having a difficult time with your concept of reality. And by the end of that book, I was like, I don't even know who I am. I don't even know what is happening right now. <laughs> like, I don't even understand my own reality. 
And that's so cool. And that's kind of like I as a horror author, that's really where that's like my that's where I'm striving. You know, that's the level that I want to be at is to de- develop something that's so scary and so personal that it makes people afraid to leave their homes. You know, like that makes people afraid. Yeah. Like on a, in a real it, way. It's not enough to make your characters go slowly insane. You have to make your readers feel like they're also going insane as well. Yeah. And it's really funny because I have actually thought a lot about this uh, in the last, I would say, four or five years. I have done a lot of thought about how I want to do this. And I feel that the next level of horror, and you're not even asking for this, but I'm just going to say it. I think the next level of horror is interactive horror. And I think that it is not being exploited the way that it needs to be. And there is just this fantastic opportunity to use information and technology to write horror in such a way that it is personalized. And if you personalize horror, I think that you can just scare the crap out of somebody. I definitely agree. And, and to me, just, you know, because I'm going to follow you down this rabbit hole a little bit. To me, I feel like this is why oftentimes something like a horror video game can be so effective. Like, yeah, I can I can watch horror movies all day and very rarely do I really get deeply affected by one or, you know, stay up late, you know, ha- have a hard time falling asleep or something afterwards. But a video game, oh, it's going to get under my skin ten times more intensely because I'm the one who's doing it. And so I agree, and, and I'm, I'm really excited to see that a lot of, like, really cool horror creators are trying to kind of push the limits of, of what a piece of horror fiction can be and, and make it more personal and make it more interactive and things like that. Like, I know... For example, uh, the the people who made the uh, film Host from last year, if, if uh, you guys are familiar with that one, it's like the Zoom horror mm-hmm. movie. That, like, I, I know that they are currently working on, like, a AR, yeah, so augmented reality, like, uh, gaming experience kind of thing that is, yeah, so, supposed to be, you know, very trippy and... Yeah, I'm I'm down for it. So, yeah, it, any anything that can, yeah, really... M- play with me as as the person who is consuming the the media uh i'm i'm there for it and yeah i i 100 agree with you with house of leaves like house of leaves was such a unique reading experience it's it's definitely a horror book that i talk about a lot to people but i have to like tell them i don't think you're ready for this one yet <laughs> exactly yeah that's so funny i actually do that a lot too i my husband i read it you know and um and I, I just, I couldn't stop talking about it. I was like, oh my gosh, this book is so great. And, uh, and then he tried to pick it up and I'm like, so I need you to be aware <laughs> that there are some things that you need to know about this book before you begin it. One of them being that it reads very much like a textbook and it is very important for you to read all the footnotes in order and to, and it is a lot of work. Like it's, it, it's a, it's work that you put into reading this book. If you want to get the correct experience from the book, you have to you know, put the work in. And that, that's not like everybody's bag. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know how many people start that book and then just don't make it all the way through. <laughs> I'm guessing that there are some people who don't make it because uh, it is a little bit tough to, to understand you know how to how to do it yeah i mean it's not every book that you read that you involve like six bookmarks and uh you have to like turn exactly. it sideways and if you read it in public exactly you do stop and go what are you reading what is going on <laughs> why are you why do you keep flipping back and forth and and there's this whole there's actually a whole section where you um you have to decode oh, yeah the what you're reading so uh, it's written in code, and you have to decode the whole thing. Um, and then, of course, it was originally written as um, I feel like it was written as a hypertext. A hypertext is that right? Because there are actually link there are linked words that you'll find throughout the book. And I I've always wondered about that because the um, it uses it uses different fonts for different for different words or uh, different colors for different words, which is really weird. Um, and I, I, I have, was under the impression that it was originally an online text or it had been an online text or something like that. But I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm full of I, crap. I don't know. I want to say that he tried to make it feel that way, but I don't think it actually existed in that format. 
it's definitely worth, I feel like, and now that we're talking about it, I should definitely read it again. I, I feel like there's probably more stuff going on in that book that I didn't catch. Just, it, there's probably so much more stuff going on in that book. Oh, for sure. Now, uh, now that we've uh, kind of gotten to, to know you guys as uh, you know connoisseurs of of uh, horror, I, I do want to hear a little bit more about press as well as the humans are the problem uh, monster anthology that's coming up and all of that. So, uh, go ahead, uh, tell us all about this. Tell us where where we'll be able to find it. How we can you know, how listeners of this can check this out and support support you guys and all that. Cause uh, this is definitely something that I am uh, following pretty closely myself. So I could start off a little bit. I, I hinted before that I was involved with another press um, in the past and uh, did some projects with that. Uh, specifically, I did a, a Kickstarter uh, about fairy tales, um, and that's how Willow came across me. And then um, that other press I was working with, or that I was a founder of, it sort of imploded and went away. And I sent out a message to all my Kickstarter backers saying, hey, you know, we talked about doing more books along this line and everything. And I really appreciate you guys, but sort of uh, so long and thanks for the fish type thing because I'm out. Um, and uh, Willow sent me a message that same day saying, hey, Mike, I want to talk to you. You did a Kickstarter. It was great. I want to do something like this with you. And then getting to know her a little bit more. And she sent me an email and I saw that her email was, had weird little worlds in it. And I was like, tell me about this. And she's like, well, it's my brand that I've been working on and everything. And I was like, that is a phenomenal name. I love it. I love the origin of it. And, uh, she's like, well, we could use it as the name of a press if we want to go that far. I was like, yeah, that's amazing. And then, so she, she pitched the idea of our first Kickstarter within weird little worlds. And I'll let her tell about that. But that's that's how we came across uh, founding this new press, building off of Willow's existing brand, um, getting a little bit of my expertise in there as well. Really, what we want to focus on is great storytelling, impacting the world for good. I mean, we talk about being kind um, and helping people, you know, just have some positive influence and have hope in their lives. But also another thing that's a big tenet of our of our press is we want to make sure that authors are getting paid what they deserve. We don't want to we're we're not an exposure press. We're like, yeah, you you get exposure for being in part of this. No, we're 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 both writers ourselves, and we're not gonna be cheapskates and cheap other other authors out of out of livelihood. So uh, that's a huge tenet of us of our of our press or what we want to do is make sure that. Authors are getting what they deserve. They're compensated. Praise. <laughs> <laughs> Reach, brother. Preach. <laughs> so yeah, so that's where we're at. And so then, and and I think that's part of what Willow liked about my past Kickstarter was that was something I talked about in there was I'm going to pay authors and I'm not going to pay them pittance. I'm going to pay them semi-professional rates because that's what I could do. Um, and I, I did it, and it, I didn't make very. Actually, I was in the hole at the end of the pro that project, but I was glad to do it because I created something super fun, and the authors got paid, and that was important to me. So I'll let Willow talk about the, the Kickstarter project that we're doing now because it's even better than what I have even done in the past. It was cool. I followed Mike at Fiction Vortex, and I was a part of his uh, Kickstarter backer group. I was really impressed with... I've. So I have a really strong marketing background. That's what I do for a living. I'm a, I'm a marketing director and I've been doing that for about 10 years um, with a really strong social media background. Um, and if you have been following our Facebook page, uh, you'll see a lot of that uh, work, right? <laughs> We've gained, I don't know, there's some insane stats on our, and we like, like grown by like 19,000% over the last month or something. It's just crazy. So, but I think that's what attracted Mike to working with me is he knew that I could market whatever it was that we were going to work on. And, and of course I was attracted to him because I loved everything about what he was doing. I loved his own marketing. He has a really good eye for a great idea. Um, and, uh, we actually still have, uh, the, his book that he edited Grifty Shades of Faze, um, not horror, but is still great, a, a great book. And we still have that and we'll be selling that as well. But what's really awesome 
is that I have this really just passionate love for horror, and I always have. Um, and so I thought, let's go ahead and just get in. Let's do horror. Let's let's do something awesome. We had this whole idea, uh, like I had been working on for the last couple of years that I had actually pitched somewhere else, and they told me that yeah, that, that I could edit the book and it would be my anthology. Except that we would just go ahead and have authors write something, and then we would set up some kind of shared royalty on the back end. And I. I was like, that sounds like garbage. You like, you're not going to pay people up front for their stories. That sounds terrible. So, I didn't love it. So I, I've been, I've been kind of like holding on to it. And then um, all this stuff happened. I found Mike, and I was like, let's do this thing. And I, we started kind of working out what it was we wanted to do. Um, and I realized it was like a week before the Kickstarter started, and we had put in all of this money. We had a cover made, and we had all this stuff. And and I was like, Mike this isn't going to work. Like this idea is not good enough. We need a better idea. Was, to <laughs> to be so, true, both of us were at the point where we're just sort of like sick of looking at it. We just weren't feeling it at all. Yeah, it, it just wasn't, it just wasn't going to work. I, well, the real problem was I was like, I was getting ready to reach out to these big named authors because I was like, I'm going to go straight to the top. I'm going to go to the people who I love reading and I want them to be in this. And I sat down to start doing pitches and I was like, I can't pitch this book. It's so it's just not going to work. And so me and Matt, me and Mike had this meeting and I was like, we've got to come up with something else, man. This is not going to work. <laughs> and he's like, yes. And so in like an hour, we completely changed the entire direction of the book. And we knew that it was the right thing to do. And that's what we're doing right now, which is the Monsters of the Problem anthology, which is really a monster. It's a pro monster propaganda uh, campaign is what it is. Like that's the anthology is it's a book for about and by monsters and monster advocates promoting the monster agenda and it's a hundred percent a propaganda campaign and it's wonderful and it's been so effective and everybody i've pitched it to has wanted to be a part of it i mean like with very few exceptions but we have these huge amazing names you know like gabino iglesias and gamma files john langan dj tranchel who was uh named the you know top 50 scariest books in 50 states which is amazing like right along you know stephen king's Maine and uh just bananas and we've got um lh moore who is in everything and michael brent collings who you know like philip fracossi these are all people who are bram stoker award winners shirley jackson winners they're just incredible writers and they're they've all just they've just been so excited to be on board we're getting brand new stories from everybody i have some people who are currently um being onboarded right now who i can't say but awesome 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 people and so i've been like just telling people you know you gotta get you gotta buy the book now before i (laughs) before i say who's coming next because it's you're gonna have there's gonna be a run on these books (laughs) so you gotta get it now these these books are it's gonna be awesome well i i mean i'm i'm excited to read it and you know, excited for you as as a friend. Just the the more I, I see about it, uh, the the more exciting it is. And and yeah, definitely want to just you know shamelessly plug your guys' Kickstarter. So yeah, it's called Humans Are the Problem: A Monsters Anthology. Uh, what what is the uh, what is your website? Just so that way people can probably you know more uh, easily find it. The website itself is weirdlittleworlds.com. And that's actually another reason why I wanted to work with Will, because she had that great name and we didn't have to come up with some type of BS acronym or anything like that that we could use. She had that domain already. I was like, yes, it's such a, such a great name. And it really just encompasses everything that I want to represent in, in writing because I'm weird and I like going off in my own little worlds. And so yeah, weirdlittleworlds.com. If you go to that homepage right there on the homepage in the header, it says back our Kickstarter. You can also go to Kickstarter, and if you dig in the Projects We Love section, um, you'll find it. You'll find Monsters Are, are Humans Are the Problem in there, but if you just search it on Kickstarter as well, you'll find it too. So, But we'd love you to go through our website and see um, a little bit more about us and what we've gotten in development. And, and then you'll see how awesome the Kickstarter is and, and uh, all of the awesome perks and uh, all of the writers here and everything. It's uh, it's it's some exciting stuff. I uh, am definitely going to get me a copy of this book. So uh, well, and even if you have, it, I mean, just yeah. go to the Kickstarter and watch the video. Uh, I was just at a family event uh, 
birthday party for one of my nieces, and like five people in my family like came up and they're like, "Mike, I love that video. I love that video." And I'm like, <laughs> I, "I I planned a little bit of it, but that's all Willow. I mean, that all came from her. It's a phenomenal video." And they're like, "How did you make that?" And I'm like. Willow has connections, and Willow's the one that directed it, and I gave my insight, and she took some of it, but ran with most of what she had already. And they're like, oh, so you didn't make it? I was like, not really. And they're like, that makes sense. And I'm like, oh! No, actually, they're like, no, it's so awesome. And and they loved it. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, the, that, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's really, that's really nice to hear, actually. I, it, that was a very big part of the, the project. So yeah, it's a big really part nice of the hear, project, but. but I'm kudos to Willow. She pulled it off in a week. Seriously, like from start to finish, it was in a week. And I was just, like blown away that she's able to get all that done. Yep. It's not as scary as uh, the, the movies you typically uh, talk about, Nathaniel. So well, I'm sorry. Well, well, that's that's the thing about our show is that we we try to show like all all sorts of sides of, of horror with, with this show. You know, everything from folklore and the occult to the creepiest movies and the the funniest movies. So, I mean, like one of our last episodes was talking about Tucker and Dale versus Evil. So, oh my gosh, I love that movie. That's like one of my <laughs> favorite movies of all time. Well, that's because it's fantastic. Yeah, it's really funny because uh, one of the things that we've heard, uh, at least from one person, is. Uh, that this campaign is really light. You know, it is a really light campaign. This is a very tongue in cheek, highly, highly propaganda campaign. It is very clearly fun. It's been fun. We've been doing a lot of contests. We have an art contest we're running here um, starting Monday. So um, we have a monster manifesto, which is a propaganda pamphlet that comes along with your book uh, that is very pro monster, you know, this is a uh, this is a plea to uh, for for advocating for the monster cause and uh and it's and it's been really fun. It's like a really fun campaign and it has been really light. And there are people who are like are your are your stories going to be really light? Is it going to be, you know, a bunch of fluff? And the answer is Look at the author no. list. No. The answer <laughs> Yeah, the answer is if you have ever read any of these people, you know that light is not really what they do. So um, this this will have scary stories in it. Like it will be a scary. I really want to get this kind of uh, this kind of like candy on the outside, arsenic on the inside kind of <laughs> like vibe going. Like yeah, it looks very innocuous, but once you open it, you're gonna be you're gonna be disturbed and concerned. You know, like we we want people to know that. Well, well, yeah, that that, that just makes it more uh, the book a monster itself. The uh, the deceptive kind of, you know, it, it lures you in with a a balloon and a you know clown smile. You know, and, and we're not going to be upset if like some mom say this book makes it on or it's going to make it on shelves. But anyway, we're we're not going to be upset if some mom like is at the store and she's like, I really need to get a book for my son to read. Maybe he'd like something. Oh, this is a cute book. Like it's got this cover on it. I'm just. No, it looks great. And then takes it over. And then, like, later that night, that kid comes screaming into the bedroom. He's like, Mom, what'd you make me read? Ah, you know. You know if that happens, I'm not going to be upset. It's just going to, you know, it's even better. Because right. I guarantee you that kid's going to be like Willow when she was young and go and sneak the book back and be like, I got to finish it now. Goals. Exactly. We really wanted, a, we really wanted a very, like, like, scary stories to tell in the dark. Uh, you know, like, we we want something that is accessible that doesn't have gratuitous language and violence, but um, that has enough enough actually legitimately scary stuff in it uh, that it's going to make even from anybody from thirteen to ninety five really uncomfortable. Like we really, we really want people to you know to be scared. We want them to be uncomfortable. But also let's not. Let's face the facts that sometimes the best horror is funny. Like it's a really special kind of book that can be both scary and funny. And we're looking, we're looking for those people. Like it's really, really rare to find it in books. It's actually more, it's more often you find it in movies like Shaun of the Dead and Cabin in the Woods and uh, Tucker and Dale. Like this is some of my favorite movies, you know, of all time. Um, it's more often you find that in movies, but it's really rare to find it in books. Uh, and the only, the really, like, 
well, John dies at the end. <laughs> like that's that's the book. You know, it's funny. Yeah, and or, it's scary, or I guess like Brady Hendrix's really stuff, but yeah, not too many other people are really <clears throat> putting that kind of thing out. Yeah. Well, and and we we want something. Yeah, it's it's very rare. This, I, you can get me on a soapbox about great storytelling anytime. Like I will just preach and preach about great storytelling. And Willow mentioned like the episodic horror that she liked and and things of that sort. Like Twilight Zone, it has staying power, and it wasn't full of gratuitous sex and violence. It was, it had just other things that got in your head, and it makes you think about things, and it stays with you. And that's what we want to accomplish. I mean, I want, I want people to think about what they read like a month later, a year later, five years later. Like I want them to walk by their bookshelf and look at that book and get a, sh- get a and shudder and go, oh, that story, oh, and and have to think about it for the next like hour and try to get and and probably have to go and pick it up again and read it again. I want staying powder or not powder, but power. Um, and so I think that's that's what we're trying to accomplish here. Well, let's kind of maybe transition to it to the next part of of our uh, episode because uh, I, I think definitely everyone out there should hopefully be you know rearing to to pick up, up a copy because I mean just for that author list alone like definitely worth your time. But yeah, so I wanted to shift gears to just kind of talk a little bit about you know so so yeah what are what are some of your favorite pieces of short uh, fiction. You know, we we were talking a little bit before the the episode started about you know uh, Willow's love of like horror anthology TV series. Um, so yeah, I I want you know not not just like what what are the best anthologies, but like what are the best like single episodes or best short uh, sorry horror short stories or things like that that uh, that have stuck out to you. You know, as a as a viewer, as a reader, things like that, and I can kick us off just because I have a a recommendation, uh, a Stephen King uh, piece that I love with all of my heart that no one seems to have read, and it makes me sad. Um, you know, so not only is my favorite Stephen King book one that no one's read, my favorite short story by him is also one that people don't seem to know about. Oh, that's great! Tell me, it's N, just the the letter N period. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, it, it was collected in his Just After Sunset collection. Yes. Uh, and yeah. I, I absolutely love it because it's, it's about OCD. Um, you know, the, the main character has OCD and, and basically like he sees this like circle of stones kind of, you know, like a, a minor. St- yeah. I remember this one. Yeah. 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 It's, it's kind of like a, like a, I don't know, lesser Stonehenge kind of thing that he sees and, and he goes and he counts it and it's like 12, mm-hmm. uh, stones. And then he counts it again because, you know, his, his, uh, mm-hmm. compulsion is counting. And it's thirteen, and, and like it, it can never resolve, and it drives them insane. And it's such a great story. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah, that's a really, really good one. I re- I remember that one. That one's great. Actually, the truth is, is um, is horror people hate <laughs> horror people hate it when everyone is only talking about Stephen King. But the fact is, is that he is the master of the short form in our current time. I believe. I I actually don't think there's anyone that rivals him for short form. Uh, and I think that it's because he grew up on the really great masters, which is Ray Bradbury and, um, uh, uh, oh my gosh, uh, I can't believe I just forgot. Uh, I am legend Masterson. Sorry. Uh, no, that's wrong. Matheson. Math, Matheson. Oh my gosh, my brain. Plus died. also, you know, Shirley Jackson and, and others too. Oh, right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but Shirley Jackson, once again, I, I don't, I never think of her as for short form, like uh, hardly ever, because really what she's mostly known for are these kind of longer novella length um, story, you know, like uh, We Have Always Lived in the Castle and um, Hill House. Those, those, you know, yeah, exactly. Like they're, they're a little bit longer, but Matheson and Bradbury, really, those are the guys that Stephen King, read, you know, grew up reading as well as, I mean, like he's lots of other people, obviously, that I am just not, you know, smart enough to remember them. But um, those are the guys I love, too. And he's just such, he really just is just a master. And uh, I, 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 like my favorite book of his is actually um, Different Seasons. And there's not a single one of those stories. There's only four. There's not a single one of those stories is bad. They're all good. They're all really, really good. Um, and the last one's the one that nobody knows, but I love, which is called The Breathing Method. Oh, yeah. And it's really interesting. It's so funny because 
you wouldn't think of it as a tip like it like it almost doesn't fit in that anthology because it's not real it's not like a horror horror you know like it's definitely interesting and you know it's got like kind of a horror element uh, but it actually has so much there's so much weight in it there's so much like heart to it and i just love that like there's um there's a there's a story and i can't remember which anthology it's in it's called the last rung on the ladder that's another Stephen King. I can't remember which anthology it's in, but but it's another one of those where it's not really a traditional horror story. But there's just so much heart, and it. it's just such a good story with such good characters about a girl and her brother who um, who commits suicide. It's very interesting. One of them commits suicide. I just can't remember. One. Maybe it's the girl that commits suicide. Anyway, yeah. So, oh, there's so much good. There's so much good short fiction. Um, and then, like I was saying before we kind of started this the great horror like there was i think there was this really really fantastic moment in history back in the 60s and 70s when great horror short fiction was being translated into television and um, we've seen a little bit of resurgence of that and i think that's so awesome you know i love the um the uh is it jordan peele the yes. one who was yes. doing the new twilight i think yeah, so we like he, you know, he attempted to bring back the Twilight Zone, and that's like the third time it's been rebooted. Um, and I have watched every, like, I've watched all of those, and I haven't had a chance to see his because it was like paywalled, right? So I didn't get a chance to see it yet, which is super sucks. But I love the fact that we're kind of moving that way, where we're taking short fiction and it's being turned into, you know, movies and television, and um, in this Netflix, you know, Netflix age, everybody wants, you know, everyone's just wants good content. And so this is a really fantastic moment for short fiction writers, because if you can write a really great story, it can become really great television. I think that that this is a really I think this is another moment in time where short fiction can become more palatable to the masses. And, uh, you know, the short fiction, you know, the short fiction masters of right now are being able to turn their fiction into television. Well, speaking of, do you have any particular like episodes of different TV uh, anthologies or anything like that that you want to uh, shout out? Because um, you know, there's some really good stuff out there. There, there are, and I just wish I was. I wish I was. Uh, I wish I just was a little bit more well versed in what's happening right now. The truth is, is I have seen like, like I historically am just really attracted to kind of this kind of. 60s to the 80s uh, episodic anthology that's when i was just i'm just really attracted to it because i don't have to worry about um i don't have to worry about some content that i don't really want to see right so that is like that's really where my like that's where my wheelhouse is but i think that it's been really cool to see um you know i i think black mirror is just freaking brilliant like i just think it is brilliant i have loved so many of those episodes and the one that I would shout out uh, and everybody's already seen all these so it's not no novel or anything but Shut Up and Dance is just really a really really terrifying uh, ride if you've ever seen Black Mirror um, that's a really terrifying example of really good storytelling because have you seen that one Nathaniel? Um, remind me of the, what the gist is yeah, this is, it's just really terrible. Um, it's about a guy, he's a kid, he's like 16, and he um, gets caught by this, um, uh, what do they call it? Um, kind of this, this, this hack program where it, um, it's watching you. Uh, it's called Shrive. And um, basically what it does is it will video record you without you knowing it and it'll see what sites you're going to. And then it uses that information against you, um, to, um, to blackmail you. Right. Oh yeah. Yep. I remember this one. Um, yeah, it's literally, it's just incredibly, incredibly dark and incredibly, um, it's just really terrible because I, and I think that the, it's, just the writing is so good because if you think about it from just a narrative perspective, you begin the you begin the story with one perspective, and it's my favorite type of narrative where you begin the story believing one thing, and then by the end of the story, you realize that you've been wrong the entire time. Yeah, I remember that twist ending, and, and uh, it was quite the gut punch. Yeah, 
It is. It is seriously a gut punch. And and it makes you reevaluate your whole perspective. And uh, and I seriously, I was like, I don't know that I can watch any more of these. <laughs> that, that was so bad. And because you've identified with this character and then when the end comes and you realize that um, that you didn't understand, like you just didn't understand. It, it's very, very, it's very interesting and, and horrifying, you know. So I think Black Mirror is doing just fantastic work. Um, uh, creating short fiction and and taking it from the page um, and putting it onto um, the screen. Yeah, I I think that yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say I I really 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 love their episode called White Bear. Yeah. Oh man, that one that one was kind of a trip as well. That you know it just kind of starts off with you know a bunch of or this this girl wakes up with no memory of why she or where she is or why she's there mm-hmm. and then. She goes outside and there's just like people like staring at like phone screens and and if anyone sees it, it's just like all all the screens have this weird symbol on it. It's almost like this, you know, kind of almost weird zombie thing. And there's some people that are chasing her and then just oh the the ways that that story twisted and turned just mm, that's that's my kind of horror. Exactly. I think that um, like I said, this kind of intersection where we're at right now in history, where we are dealing with a massive transition from being an analog society to a digital society makes makes short fiction like Black Mirror work really really well like short short horror right makes it work really well because we and and the same thing with like it follows and the host like you're talking about we are really attracted to that stuff because we are all dealing with a transition we are dealing with a movement into a world where we are increasingly connected only through the internet um and so it gives us new things to fear and new things to explore and that's what horror is always about is what are we exploring in our world how are we exploring the dangers of our worlds you know how are we managing the things that we don't understand and i love that people are taking advantage of this opportunity to tell those stories so that we can begin to grapple with the unknown of the technology that we're kind of living in. Well, Mike, do you have any uh, pieces of like horror, short fiction, uh, and any sort of media that that you want to highlight? I've just been enthralled listening to you guys. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so there's just a few of them that stand out to me. Uh, One of my favorite short stories that's uh, horror stories is The Rats in the Wall by... uh, Lovecraft. Yeah. It's another descent into madness, but also, you know, a little bit of cannibalism and all kinds of fun stuff like that that gets thrown in there. I love that story. I, I read it and I was like, gosh dang, this is creepy. And, I, you know, just the scratching in the wall and everything. And it's just. Yeah, that, that that's definitely top tier Lovecraft. Yeah, and it's it's not even any of the Eldritch stuff. It's not any of the, the Cthulhu or the, the Elder Gods or anything like that. It's just straight up demented family history type stuff you know so that and then that the the previous press that i founded started off as a short story magazine and we had a horror contest two years and there's two stories that i absolutely loved from there and they're still available online you can still find them um and you know people probably haven't read them because it's just sort of a no-name press that it was there, but uh, one is uh, called Buried Secrets, and it's just creepy. It's it's almost like straight up stuff that you find in the supernatural TV show, and uh, and it's it's a fun one. It's it just makes it so that you don't want to go to sleep at night because you don't know what's in your basement. And then the other one is a Civil War type ghost story, and it's called Not Forgotten, and it's. It's got a whole lot of the, you know, trying to make things right by finding finding the bones and placing them in the right place to stop the, the horror of the haunting and all that stuff. So I'm I'm a big fan of those. I'll, I'll, I'll shoot you the links and people can find them and read them if they want. But they're, they're, just, they're just fun little short stories, but they're ones that, as I mentioned before, they have staying power for me at least. I, I just, I remember them all the time when I think about what's creeping me out. Well, you know, you you talking about yeah those those kinds of stories that just like get under your skin and and just stay with you. 
has made me think of a, a story by Clive Barker. It's in, I don't remember which one of the books of blood it is. It's called uh, In the Hills, the Cities. Oh, man, that story messed me up. I actually bought that Books of Blood just to read that story. Well, it is, yeah, that that story just, yeah, well, then you know. It's it's just uh, upset. Uh, for, for those of you who are, who are unfamiliar, the, the gist of it is that it is uh, a gay couple that are just you know, kind of traveling through Eastern Europe, um, and they stumble upon this site of, of basically these, like, two towns that are, fighting each other but not like as individuals like they have like like formed these giants which like kind of stacking on top of each other i guess if, if you've seen uh the movie uh wreck it ralph 2 the the ralph breaks the internet it, it's kind of like the end of that movie weirdly enough but the just this this big weird monstrosity of, of these these people fighting just really I don't know. It, it it upset me in this this way that that was very visceral. Of course, you know some some other ones that I really love would be you know some some pieces that you know you encounter kind of more in, in like high school English classes. But I mean, I am a high school English teacher, so I have to you know shout out to them. You know things like Telltale Heart by Poe or uh, The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Yeah, or even like you know the lottery by Shirley Jackson. I you know all all of those are just. I mean they're they're classics for a reason. We teach them for a reason. They're just top tier great horror. Willa, do you have any more uh, stories to to you know talk about or you know I mean more TV shows or whatever? I mean you know definitely just want to get some great recommendations out there in the world because I I feel like you know so so often uh, especially on this podcast we focus so much on movies that we don't get to give. Uh, horror writing that's due. My real wheelhouse is kind of this golden age of short fiction on television. And I wish that there was more stuff, like, I, I really want there to be more of it. Like, I really want that to be there. And I feel like, but this is a great opportunity also, because if you haven't ever, can, like, looked at any of that stuff, this is this is a great time to do it, because it's all available. So, um, like, I think one of the most underrated kind of short fiction television episodic compilations is Tales from the Dark Side, which only ran for, like, three seasons or something. But it's so weird and so scary. Um, Just really, really weird. And another one is uh, Freddy's Nightmares, which is... Uh, it was a silly thing. It was uh, ran really late at night um, in the I don't know, like eighty five or something like that. Uh, maybe maybe a little bit later, but um, it was hosted by Freddy Krueger, and uh, so every Saturday night, Freddy Krueger would get on and he would host this anthology, you know, series of short horror fiction, and it was uh, it was super scary. So definitely worth looking at if you're not into it. But my uh, my. My big favorite is Night Gallery. And if you've never seen any of that, if you're too young to have ever seen any Night Gallery or your parents never made you watch it, that was the moment in history when television horror became an actual thing. Because up to that point, you had television science fiction, which was still kind of like poo-pooed by most people um, until Twilight Zone won an Emmy, right, for the weird-faced people episode. And I can't remember what it's called, but... Anyway, it won an award. And so all of a sudden, science fiction television became like, oh, I guess this is a thing. And then Star Trek won an award uh, just after that. Gene Roddenberry got a bunch of props for putting Star Trek on on the air and they had their first interracial kiss. It was a really big deal. So anyway, blah, 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 all this stuff. The fact is, is that uh, at right around that same time, we had um, Rod Serling actually developed night gallery which was like twilight zone except for after hours like this is the darkest part of twilight zone right and it was it's really scary and there's a lot of really creepy stuff in it and and it's definitely worth watching like it's not it doesn't have the kind of you know weight that twilight zone had it wasn't trying to say a bunch of stuff it was really just trying to scare people and it was the first thing that was like that, you know, on television that was just designed to be scary. And one of my favorite episodes, oh my gosh, uh, stars, oh my goodness, um, 
Oh my gosh, my brain is going to totally die. I can't remember. <laughs> I'm so sorry. In Forrest Gump. Come on, help me out here. What's her name? She's super famous. <laughs> Sally Field. Yes, yeah, Sally Field. <sighs> it's like my favorite episode. It, play, it stars Sally Field. And she's this, this woman who becomes, she becomes possessed. And it's interior monologue. It comes, like, the entire episode is her trying to run away from this. Like, there's this terrible thing that she knows it's, like, following her or whatever. And in the end, you know, it, like, it possesses her. And, and it's taken her body. And she's trapped in her own living body while this possessing demon has taken her body over. It, she is so good in that episode. And um, she's just a phenomenal actress. And, uh, and it's so terrifying. This idea of being trapped alive in your own body, you know. So anyway, it's it's really good. So I don't know. That's the kind of stuff I'm into. I, I think everybody should, if you, especially if you love horror and you write horror or you just love watching horror, if you haven't gone back and seen some of the old horror episodic uh, horror stuff, it really is worth doing. And it's all available right now with like really just like the click, click of the button. You can just watch all of those episodes in a big row and you can see the great, you know, Richard Matheson wrote for night gallery. He wrote for twilight zone and then he wrote stuff like I am legend and, uh, you know, he's just brilliant. So it's definitely worth getting into. Yeah. I mean, Richard Matheson's just the best. I mean, he not, yeah, he's not so only good. did he write amazing horror, you know, he also wrote stuff like uh, Somewhere in Time and What Dreams May Come yeah. and stuff like that. Like, oh, oh my God, he, so brilliant. He's just a man. And uh, people these days don't know his work nearly well enough. And I, I wish that um, like there there's a lot of movement happening right now. Like I said, with with these kind of new up and coming authors that are getting their short stories made into movies and stuff like that. And I like. It's not short fiction, but we have a lot of really great authors that are really good at short fiction that are creating these pieces. Like Josh you know, Mailerman did Bird Box, and now he's doing the follow up to that. And I know he, there's just like a bunch of people who are really just fantastic writers that are moving their fiction onto the screen. And I just think that it's just a great time to be a horror writer. It just really is. Yeah, and and I definitely think that also, you know, horror is getting a lot more respect, I think, just kind of by the mm-hmm. non-horror community. Not the first time, but definitely, you know, it, it, this is kind of a, an interesting time to see that, you know, a lot of people are, are going out and seeing uh, some of these horror movies that are, you know, then winning Oscars or getting nominated at the very least. You know, like right now we have Promising Young Woman. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we had Get Out, we had Shape of Water, which is, you know, horror adjacent mm-hmm. at the very least. Uh, Hereditary got tons of uh, attention and you know, all, all of these for good reason. So, yeah, it's it's an exciting time to be a horror creator, uh, I have to say. Yeah, it is. It's super exciting. And I think it's really cool to have um, things like this that are like really focusing on the experience of horror, you know, of lit- of horror literature, and and maybe it's video, or maybe it's um, horror art, or maybe it's horror, you know, actual like books and short stories. But we're all kind of we're all dealing with um, the world through horror, and I think that that's the way you have to do it. The world kind of is horrifying, and I and you know the reason why we do horror is because. We're trying to have some kind of control over it. We want to explore, you know, we want to have some kind of control over how awful things are. I really do believe that's why we do what we do. At least that's one of the reasons why I do it is, you know, there's lots of horror out there I can't control, you know, but, but when I put it into my hands, um, then it becomes something I manage and it helps me to deal with the horrors that I have no control over. I agree 100%. Okay, well, I think we we might be a little uh, long on time, so I guess, did you have any other uh, final thoughts or anything like that uh, relative to horror before we kind of start wrapping up? You, you've been quiet for a minute there, Mike, if, if you want to have any last thoughts to uh, throw out Don't there. let the, the regret cause horror in your life of not backing our project. I'll just say that. Just, just shameless plug right there. You know, you will regret it if you don't back it. 
Well, there we go. There we go. That yeah, not not backing up this this piece is is really the real horrifying thing. The the unending uh, existential threat. Okay. It's true. You definitely you definitely will have unending existential dread because we'll send monsters after you. Thank you both for, for being on the show. It's it's been a tremendous pleasure. Before you go, where can people find you online? You know, we've already plugged your uh the, the website Weird Little Worlds. I but yeah, where where else can people find you online? You know, if, if you want to plug your Twitter or whatever. Uh, or other projects that you've done or anything like that. It's a good time to do that. Um, so you can find uh, me on Facebook under, uh, you look up Michael Clough, whatever address is uh, MKA Clough, and that's me directly on Facebook. But then also our Facebook page is Weird Little Worlds, and that would be a good place to follow us as well to keep up up to date on any new projects or even submissions because submissions are open right now for the story. That's right. We have slots open for people to write in there. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's a few other places that I'm, I exist on the, the, the internet that's like Twitter and, uh, Instagram, but I never use those. So Facebook's the place. Yeah. If you do want to find us on Twitter, you can, uh, you can go to weird lit worlds and uh, find us there. I believe that we are Weird Little Worlds on Instagram and we are Weird Little Worlds on Pinterest as well. So uh, yeah, we're in in all of the places, uh, but we spend a lot of our time on Facebook and that's where we're running our contest and where we are giving out prizes for both our art contest for the cover of our propaganda piece, The Monster Manifesto, and uh, where we're running our Name Our Monster contest, which has to do with the kind of featured monster of our anthology and we're running that contest up until until Sunday night uh this coming week but uh, by the time this posts it's probably going to be over so okay well that definitely uh should be wrapping things up uh so since there's nothing else to say I'll just have to say stay spooky need even more scream kings here's our obligatory shameless social media plug Follow us on Twitter or Instagram at Screen Kings Pod. You could also email us at ScreenKingsPodcast at gmail.com. Help us reach a wider audience of horror fans by leaving a review on iTunes or by sharing a link on social media. You can also support the show by going to patreon.com forward slash Screen Kings. Stay spooky.